for so many of us, we look back at those times where we were the most ideally beautiful, the closest to the ideals, and that was when we were starving ourselves, where we hated ourselves, where people were giving us compliments and it just fueled our over-exercising, our obsession with the outsides of our bodies at the expense of the rest of our lives. I tweaked my wrist today, yesterday. Really? And it, I'm not kidding. It's throbbing right now. Like, oh, well. Straight up throbbing. Speaking of tweaking. What? Oh, yeah. How's your, your neck? You think your wrist is tweaked? How's your neck? Think about trying to put your hair up and like do any daily activity with your br- neck broken. You got um, not acupuncture. You got dry, needled. Dry, dry needling. Dry needling. And it did help. So that actually okay. is my straight kind of moment. So we're going right fucking okay, into go. it. Right we're going in. into it today. We got guests. So let's go. That's one of our goals is literally we're just going to be a little more concise, consistent, you know, get in, get out, give you what you want and move on for the day. So got him. That's our goal this episode. We'll see. You guys can be the judge of that, I guess. Um, let us know. Yeah, let us know. Let us know what you like. If you hate the banter, if you love the banter, but we're trying. Okay. Okay. Um, straight can of moments. Straight can of moments, if you don't know, they're just, oh, sorry. I got distracted already. <laughs> Why? What happened? You grabbed the, the little slam ball instead of a torpedo. Yeah, I did. Okay. Guys, currently we have a weight closing the podcast door. So yes. Sid's cats don't claw in here. They it can is. hit the door in a pattern that will open the door. <laughs> it's crazy. Don't ask. I Absolutely don't know. They're insane. crazy. They're weird. Um, but yeah, straight kind of moments, just a moment that makes you a little more humble, makes you realize you're human, yeah. um, could be embarrassing, could be funny, could be mental health, could be shitting your pants, could be all the things. So this week, my straight kind of moment is, um, yeah, it's pretty average this week. Honestly, my moment, we don't but mind an average week. We don't mind that. That's the point of candidness is we're just average human beings. That's what I was going to say. And I'm like, we don't always have to have something hilarious happen to us. We don't no. always have to be amazing. Right. That's the yes. whole point of it. So you're right. And with, a, you know, you're with you the know, crew. We with it. Um, so I tweaked my neck on Saturday. Um, I honestly was just like hanging my head off of a workout bench. I wasn't working out, just hanging it off there, chilling. And I was texting on my phone. That's always the oh, culprit, no. right? Oh, no. And I try to sit up and I'm like, oh, fuck. Ow. And I like kind of sat up and I'm like, oh, shit. And then I start to like roll my neck around. I'm like, oh, that kind of hurt. And then it just kind of continued to get worse and worse. I had to coach a class after and I was like kind of turning like side to side. You know when you sleep on your pillow wrong? Yeah. And oh, it's yeah. just like, oh, shit. So um, I was like, okay, well, whatever. The next day, it hurt. It was like a little painful. I still tried to go to the gym and do legs. Oh shit. Yeah. And did then you do the rack. No, definitely not. I just okay, did good. quads. So it was like pretty, I didn't do anything with my neck. So like I was like, okay, machine. whatever. And I really wanted to work out with my friends. So I made it work. But then Monday rolls around. I'm like, oh, I probably shouldn't have done that yesterday. Yeah. But by Monday night, it was kind of getting a little better. Then Tuesday, I woke up. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm at like a 70%. But I was like, I'll give one more day, no workout, because it, that'll be good for me to like chill for a bit, you know, make sure it's fully healed. Um, and then I go, I'll get a massage instead of my workout. Go to my massage lady who, do, you know, she doesn't quite know the body, <laughs> I would say, at like a scientific Tell level. me what kind of massage place that you're going to. <laughs> Just give me a little little detail about it. It is like in an Asian market mall. Okay. Um, and it's a hole in the wall. And one time I showed up early to my massage and I was waiting in the parking lot. And I saw this man carry six bags of plucked chickens with their claws on. Um, Excuse me. Into the massage therapist place and she, my, the girl who always does my massage grabbed the bag with her hands her bare hands and brought it to this back room and then I continued to walk in and pay for my massage <laughs> excuse me what <laughs> were they cooking in the back I don't know what they're making with chicken feet but was it yeah. just ch- chicken feet well it was a full chicken but I could see their hands coming out oh of the good bags. lord oh that's yeah. nasty anyways and I was like get in there it felt so good at the time and then I woke up the next day and I have never been in so much pain in my you life. You probably just flared it up like yeah. nobody's business oh by my rubbing God. it out. I honestly, oh. you guys like couldn't wash my hair, couldn't do my hair, couldn't put my clothes on, couldn't put my oh, socks so on. Worst. I've never been in so much pain. I'm like, I have to go coach. Like I couldn't demo. I was trying to use my words to demonstrate movements. I'm like, this is good for, this should be a training. Good practice though. This should be a good practice for coaches yeah. to do fitness coaches. Like explaining movements that are like complicated by just your words. I was like, shit. And then- that wasn't the end of the story. Let me get there. Where am I at? 
You had a happy ending oh, massage. So, and then yeah, yeah, yeah. Happy ending <laughs> massage. It was great. She does. She sticks a little up in there. She, she does. She like pats my butt. She goes, nice booty. Nuh-uh. She, like, she always says something about nice booty. And then she goes, your boyfriend must love you. You're cute. Wait, she <laughs> yeah, does not say that. so cute. That's really cute. You know, I love her. Um, She's great, too. She gets in there. Um, there But no, my straight kind of moment realization now would be, because I'm still coaching my classes, like, with a little bit of pain going on, Um, is, you know what? We always are like picking ourselves apart, our bodies apart. And that's kind of what this episode is going to be about. Like grabbing our cellulite, grabbing your legs. And at the end of the day, every single morning when I'm coaching this class, I think these people are so lucky to be able to move their body for 50 minutes, be able to like work out, run like y'all we can walk. Like there's so many things to be grateful for. I literally just picked my nose on the camera (laughs) while I was talking and it was probably a good grab. And now it's going to be. Just kidding. You like just up and digging. Yeah, up and digging. That's my mantra for my classes. Yeah. It's like, y'all be grateful for what you have versus what you don't have. Because oh my God. Yeah. Amen. We can run. We can move our bodies. I literally, yeah. I'm like, I talked about this in the class the other day. I was like, sometimes we wake up and we think, God damn it. I didn't do anything last week mm-hmm. or the week before that or the week before that. And I'm like, yeah, you did though. You got up, you went on with your day, you moved yeah. your body. And the fact that you can move your body mm-hmm. is a freaking blessing. Yep. I even sometimes Hashtag when I'm working out, blessed. literally I'm like, huh? Um, when I'm working out, I'm like, thank you body. Like literally I'll be mm-hmm. like in my head trying to like give good juju. And I'm like, yep. thank you body for moving. Thank you for lifting. Thank you for like being able to like not hurt all the time except yes. today. Okay. I'm having a little Her. ism. What happened to your wrist? Well, I did a boxing class and I, oh, when yeah. I have broken this wrist, like I fractured it twice. Mm-hmm. And for some reason, when you fracture, you don't wear a, ca- I mean, you wear a little weird cast. I mean, it's yep. not really a cast, but regardless, like, it and you were so punching sore. hard in that class. Oh, I go you? ham. You're like, people are oh, fucking watching me. I because fucking I used to box like yeah. for two and a half years and I loved it. And so mm. when I'm in there, whoa, like, yeah, let's go, let's go. Yeah. Oh my God. Cameras you on definitely me. need their good wrist wrap, like buy the wrist wraps yeah. rather than use the free ones because it supports your wrist more. For I know because sure. it doesn't help. Yeah. And it was hilarious. I was going so hard. I was flicking my hair. <laughs> yeah, whatever. And then Sam, the photographer comes up after and he goes, Hey, I couldn't find you in there. I'm so sorry. There's not going to be like any photos of you boxing. I'm like, you like take one now. Oh, and I couldn't tell. Cause he didn't have his flash on. And I'm like, no, that that's okay. No worries. You're like I only did my makeup and like was trying to look so I only wear, I wore a high ponytail in a freaking workout class, but it's all good. It's all good. <laughs> Oh my God. I love Anyway, that. sorry. I, I we kind of went so on a good. tangent after your straight kind of moment. Do you have a straight kind of moment? This I week? do. Let me hear it. Okay. It's really kind of dumb, but then it was the realization that came to. So yep. I have a notebook that I write all of my workouts for ultra fit, the class, one of the classes I teach, whatever. It doesn't matter. I write all the workouts in there. Like every single day, every day has a different one. I look back and I change things or I take things and I like add on to it, whatever. Do you get to create your own workout now? Um, I do in one of my classes. Oh my one God, I do, fun. one I don't. What, the, the one I do, I can't change the running part, but I can change every movement on the ground is mine. And I then the love. other one, it's really fun. But I taught on Wednesday, last Wednesday, I dropped my notebook somewhere and I have no idea where it is. Mm. I lost like probably 50-ish written workouts, which mm, that hurts if you are out there and you've written workouts before or you're just like, you write down stuff. And then I was sitting there and I'm like, what else was in that notebook? Oh no. My entire life is in that notebook and it is somewhere with someone who knows where, like, let me just tell you, I wrote down all my mentors with their emails because I'm psychotic. I wrote down like all my 2023 goals, all my 2022 goals are in there. Like weird ones too. Like things that no one needs to know. Get a boob job. Yeah. Then it's in there. (laughs) It's in there. It's like nose job or boob job. Decide. Um, (laughs) Go to California. Like you. And I'm pretty sure I'm actually, I know I am sure, but I just don't want to make it real and speak it into existence. I like journaled a few times in there, like oh. having a hard, like having a tough time today. Like, <laughs> like periods really take me down. Like, it's just like, oh my God. Oh my God. If someone found my diary notebook uh, like that, they would think this girl, I'm sorry. But the funny thing is, is I I'm bet so the person that found that. will give know, it back. They I took it home. I bet they know it's you. <laughs> just know. Like That's it. what pisses me off. They're probably holding it hostage and they're going to be like, one day a fake account's going to DM me. Hey, oh. found your journal. Oh my if gosh. If you want it back, you can come here and give me $500. You can send me it's nudes. Like, no, literally. I'm like, okay, you can have my nipple for that because I'm oh. going to boob job anyway. So. Yeah, you're like, do it. Mm, I'm do just it. kidding. I don't know. Oh. I'm, I'm undecided, by the way, about the boob job still. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. Yeah, we'll see. same. But I go back and forth every day. Me too. I'm like, <laughs> I don't know. Maybe tomorrow I will like it. Do, anyway. I mean, when I'm looking at the picture, I sent Pat in the tanning salon. The one that I accidentally just saw yeah. on your computer? Yeah. So I sent Pat. <laughs> 
<laughs> this like, you know, when you're getting a spray tan and they like give you a hairnet and I was wearing like, oh this, my God. I wore a thong the last time I never wear thongs fully nude. Usually. I was wondering when you put on your story, I go, I, I think I said it out loud. I don't know. To who. Like, why did she wear a thong? Yeah, I said, why you I a wore a thong one because I had my period and I was like, I don't really want oh, my bloody yeah. tan on string hanging out, but like, that'd be cool. I probably still would wild. do it. Yeah. So I was like, should I wear a thong? I was asking them and she was like, if you post the, the difference, like, yeah, I won't charge you for the for the tan i'm like they're okay. so good about I was that like, i'll wear the i'll wear the thong like whatever um and i fucking love go glow i'm there every I, other week i love them it's so funny because their little promotional shit pops up on my instagram and it's always sit in a bikini it's so weird and luckily you. luckily why do your tits look so big i was wondering that in that one did they i was literally like oh my god i think it's that swimsuit well if i have nice. okay because here's I the need thing the swimsuit i don't i have not bought i have not purchased a new bra in probably long time since i was in fifth grade literally like, fifth grade haven't probably. grown yeah. so like when i'm actually like wearing a swimsuit that puts them in the right spot they look like good can you send me that link yeah i can send you that link absolutely i can You're, send you that link in i bio. literally <laughs> stare at it every time i'm like damn she looks good <laughs> but if you see my leg is like pointed out my toe yeah. and i'm looking down it's kind of a weird photo i no, think but it's a great it's photo. also me though so it's weird you should be very proud of that photo. really yeah but also like why are we fuck what we suck this is what we're talking about today. Like, oh no, why are we, why are we even complimenting this? Oh, because no. guess what? Because guess what? Now, if you were to ever like gain weight, then you think you're less worthy because, because of I that. complimented you on your body right now. So like, we will get into this and fuck, oh, it's shit. so ingrained in us, you guys. And that's why we're so excited for this episode. It's such a good episode. So who's coming on? We'll tell you. <laughs> Lexi and Lindsay, mm -hmm. they are doctors um, and they're identical twins, actually. Leading experts in the study of body image and the harmful effects of objectification they wrote the book more than a body your body is an instrument not an ornament and are co-directors of the nonprofit beauty redefined and both received phds in body image studies i wish i would have known that was a study because i would i would have gone to that oh my god i didn't know that these things were like out there i didn't even right? know that we were that progressive like five years ago mm -hmm. which is crazy to me but these two i've listened to We've, I've listened to a lot of podcasts with them. I've read a lot about what they do. Yep. And um, they were on Call Your Daddy at one point. They are so impactful mm -hmm. in the way that they speak about things. And it makes it understandable. Yes. And it's digestible, yes. actually. And, and it I'm puts hoping, things into perspective. I, exactly. I'm hoping they can make me realize and understand, and the listeners too, how we can explain this to other people who are not seeing it as it is. Like, yeah. remember how I was saying, like, well, remember I had that conversation with like Jordan and a buddy and I was like, okay, like society says this about women, but they're like, well, that's like the larger, you know, people think that and believe you don't that know already. how to explain. I don't know to how them. to s explain to them what we're feeling, what we're thinking. So I'm like, I'm hoping this is like a great conversation that like changes, especially for women listening, like explain this to your men, explain this to the men in your life. We've said that before about other topics. Like this is a great one to have your boyfriend, your significant other, your brother, your dad, even to listen to make your man, listen to this podcast with you. Honestly. Make your mans, make your mans. Um, I honestly, like the reason we want to have them on and like, well, is because of all these things, but it was even more impactful today because when I woke up and I knew we were recording today, I thought to myself, okay, let me just start to tally when I'm thinking about my physical appearance throughout the day, throughout the day. I think, made it probably about an hour before it was like 25, like literally psychotic numbers. And I wrote, literally wrote down, like I was thinking about, I noticed when I woke up and then I noticed like I fa my boyfriend FaceTimed me and I had like a, I hadn't had any makeup on. So I looked tired. And then I realized that I had a mm -hmm. scab on my forehead where I had a zit for my period. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of like trying to hide it. You know what I mean? And then crop top at workout. It like, I mean, how many times in a wow. day are you body checking, thinking of what you look like? And how many times do you think men do that? And I'm not saying, mm. and I'm not saying like men don't deal with body image issues, but they are in more comfortable clothes. Yeah. They're in longer shirts. They're not in as tight of clothes. It's just, I mean, we're going to talk all about this, but what's yeah. crazy to me is think of all the women you're listening. You've been there. The amount of time we are spending pulling our shirt down, sucking our belly in, you know, instead of maybe, I don't know going to your meeting early to prepare for the meeting. We are deciding on what outfit to wear instead yep. of, I don't know, like getting into the flow of something, whatever that is. Maybe you're coaching a fitness class. Like so example for me, yep. when I'm wearing like a comfortable outfit and I'm coaching class, I get into the flow. It feels good. I'm like, I love what I'm doing. And I notice I kind of like stop 
if I'm wearing like a sports bra and leggings, I'll stop, rethink, oh fuck, I gotta flex, mm-hmm. like I gotta remember, like I'm in a I'm in a sports bra right yeah. now. Yeah. You know, well, you then, gotta like make sure you're sucking in a little I, bit. I, I get out of this flow. And it's like, I don't know if this is has to do with the patriarchy. I don't know if this has to do with gender norms. There's just a lot to be said well, about this. Well, it has to do with all of those things. And I know that they'll talk about that mm-hmm. too. And like, it's just crazy. Cause even thinking about when I was younger, I for sure chose to be a tomboy, not only because I thought that was like the, kind of the cool thing to do, but I remember thinking to myself when I first noticed that men were like paying attention to me or just in general, yep. I didn't want the attention. So I chose not to wear dresses mm-hmm. and skirts. And I still have a hard time wearing skirts even cause I know people are looking. That's gross to me. Like knowing that just what I'm wearing, people are going to be looking at my ass and looking yep. up my skirt and different things like that. I know it's a little aggressive, but it's true. Um, but I, I remember not wanting to wear women, like girls clothes because I didn't want the attention of men. Mm-hmm. And even like the rules they have around tank tops and this and that oh my in, God, school, school. in oh schools my God. and like how some girls can get away with wearing a tank top and how some girls can't just because of the size of their boobs. Their boobies, I was going like, to say. Yeah, what, what I was relating back to like, getting out of the flow or deciding too long on outfits to wear. And the fact that men aren't doing this, it's almost like um, what as women, as half of the goddamn population, are we more than half, more than half of the goddamn population? Mm -hmm. Are we really living up to our potential? If we're spending time, money, effort, exhaustion on looking a certain way, like no. And it's so funny that this episode is now because we just had an episode about Botox fillers and our thoughts on that. And it's like, the more I listened to these girls and did some research on this, I'm like, shit, my views, like I wish we could re-record that sometimes because I'm like, my views are already changed. So it's kind of nice to kind of hear how me and Sid also grow throughout this podcast because our last episode, definitely different than this episode. Completely. Yeah. Yeah. No, you're, you're so right. And I honestly, like, I'm really excited about this conversation because even just having that reflection this morning of how many times I'm thinking about my body, how many times I'm thinking about the way that I look or insecure or whatever, how many minutes of those minutes I'm using up for thinking about my body. Could I use for something more productive? One and two, imagine if you cared as much about like the health and well being of your insides as you did as the outside Mm -hmm. of like your physical being. Like imagine, like it's crazy to me. It, it blows my mind how much we care about how we look externally versus the health and wellness of our insides. What even pisses me off is That's like crazy. the amount of times that we, like let's say we're going to dinner with our boyfriends. Yeah. They have time to decompress, to relax yeah. after work because they're ready. They're ready. But okay, well I have to go pick out an outfit. I need to look fucking snatched because I'm going on a date. Yep. I have to go get ready. And it's just like the, even these little things throughout the days that men kind of are able to just like sit back and take in and enjoy. Mm-hmm. I'm like, I feel like I don't get that. It's it, it's ex- fucking exhausting to be a girl. And I know we're maybe not explaining this perfectly, but something that really stood out to me before we get them on is I was listening to, um, actually, I mean, I know they have this in their book. I don't know if it's worded the exact way, but- we're not living as females. We're not living our lives for us. We are living it for how other people may perceive our lives. Yeah. And I was like, fuck. The male gaze. The male gaze. Brutal. All right. It's just gross. Damn. It's icky. But I'm excited to learn from them. They're extremely well-spoken women. And I can't wait for you to learn from these guys. Yeah. So without further ado. Let's bring them on. Let's bring them on. Lindsay and Lexi Kite. Hello. How are we doing today? Hi. Hi. We're so good. Happy yeah. to be here. Yeah, we're happy to have you guys. This has been, we just recorded like an intro and our initial thoughts about having you guys on. And we first heard about you through, um, which you've probably heard often, but the Call Her Daddy oh, yeah. um, podcast and you guys talking about the male gaze. And it was a complete mindset shift for me. And I was immediately obsessed with you guys. <laughs> so Yay. we did some research. We sent a few emails. And the fact that you're here right now, like we couldn't be we're grateful and we do really appreciate your time. So thanks so much. Uh, that's so nice. We're pumped to be here. Um, first question, I guess, is we explained the, your guys' background a little bit, but like how did you get into even researching like female body image? And yeah, how did that start? And what exactly is that? How do you get your PhD in body image? I think that is amazing. Uh-huh. Lindsay, do you want to start? Or you want me to? Feel free. 
So Lindsay and I are such identical twins and we tried so hard for years to not be such twins, like to do different stuff. And it didn't work out that way, clearly. <laughs> um, but we, you know, growing up being identical twins and like we write about this in our book, this idea that we were from the time we were so little, constantly judged and compared. and one of us was always coming out the loser. You know, it was like, you have the fatter cheeks, you have the crooked teeth, you don't do your hair, you know, whatever the thing is, we got it. There's always a winner and a loser. And it taught us from a very early age to picture ourselves from the outside, like to look at Lindsay as if she's me and judge her accordingly. So we had the meanest insults for each other growing up from, you know, age four, you're the ugly one, you're the fat one, because that's how we were you know, always compared and judged. And so when we got to college, our freshman year, we were both going into journalism, but trying to do different journalism. So I was doing broadcasting and Lindsay was doing print. And we had this required course for all journalism majors. And it was on media literacy, which is the idea that um, we were starting to learn about why media was engineered the way it was. Why are women represented so one dimensionally, you know, represented this one specific way in all of media and other, you know, other gender, violence, race stereotypes. And I remember sitting in that classroom that first day and feeling like almost a spiritual experience. Like I have been impacted by the fact that my ideals of what is normal and beautiful have been co-opted by industries and media that would, you know, beg me to believe that I'm wrong. Um, and that I went home to Lindsay in our shared dorm and told her about this class and she'd had the same class earlier that day. And we both agreed that like this was something we wanted to do and we didn't even know what it was or how to get there. Um, and that set us off on a course for 10 years of college without taking a breather, bachelor's, master's, PhDs in the work of female body image, wow. which Lindsay, do you want to jump in here? So one thing we found is that there were a lot of people that were studying media and basically um, finding out all the ways that media harms us. Media effects research is just filled with especially ways that women are so misrepresented and so sexualized and so objectified and the harms that that has on people. So of course we did a ton of that research, but we found that that makes people mad, but that's where it ends. Like really, if you make people mad, then okay, they might be more aware of what they're seeing, but where are the solutions? So all of our work from that point on was directed towards solutions. And that's where we started digging into resilience research and some of the psychology around um, recognizing the harms in our lives around objectification. And most importantly, how to use those painful moments and the shame that comes to the surface as we go throughout this objectifying environment that's actually very painful for most of us, how do we use those moments as kind of a jumping off point, like a springboard to make new choices, to be more connected to our bodies instead of ostracized from them? Can you explain objectification just for somebody yeah. who's just hearing this and they're like, what? I'm, I've never even heard of these things before. Yeah, absolutely. It's our favorite word. So root word <laughs> object. Objectification is when you are um, perceiving somebody as parts so it's slightly less than human. We dehumanize people when they're portrayed as parts, basically a compilation of parts of a body to be fixed, to be ogled, to be judged, really to be consumed. So in media, in mass media for our entire lives, women have been treated as objects to be viewed and consumed by other people. And when we are in that environment, the TV, the advertising, the even like music videos, even the lyrics of songs that we've been exposed to our whole lives, talk about women for how they look, where beauty is the most important thing. Beauty looks one very specific, very narrow way. We all know what that looks like, especially in the late 90s, early 2000s, when we were like teenagers and learning these messages firsthand. And when you grow up in that environment, you start to see yourself as an object. So you watch yourself living instead of just fully living. And that's called self-objectification. When you perceive yourself from the outside, your identity is kind of doubled. You, you split from yourself. You imagine how you look at every moment in every activity, when you're talking to somebody else, when you're at an event, an activity, doing sports, any types of physical activity, um, you're distracted and it has huge negative effects for women. We don't even recognize it's happening because it's so normal. I remember you talking about this like flow state and that just reminded me of it is it's it takes you out of the moment and not living in the present. And I was explaining before you guys hopped on of how 
I'm a fitness coach and the days where I dress in comfortable clothing, I kind of get into the flow and I really enjoy coaching. And then yeah. on days when I'm wearing maybe like a sports bra, I notice like I get distracted and I think, oh, like flex a little bit, suck in, yep. like make sure you look fit. And it takes me out of that flow state. But I know you have like a few statistics on flow state. What is a flow state? How can we stay in this flow state longer? So I remember like very early on in our research, I learned about this idea of self-objectification. And it was like this light bulb went off in my mind that said, oh, like there's a word for that thing that none of us had a name for it, that all of us do. Almost all people who represent as female or who identify as female live in a near constant state of self-objectification. So you live and you picture yourself living. Your identity is literally split. When you are in a state of self-objectification, research shows us you don't perform as well on math tests, reading comprehension tests, you can't throw a softball as far, you can't lift mm -hmm. as heavy of weights, you can't get into a flow state when you're working out, when you're running, when you're like creating art, where you need to get into that space where a portion of your mental capacity isn't being sucked away thinking about how you look. And if you think about how many of us live our lives like split in two and we don't raise our hands in class, we don't go out for that job that we want, that promotion, that event. We sit home if we have acne. You sit at home if you don't have the right outfit or you didn't look great in that picture you got tagged in. Too many of us, people of all genders, but especially girls and women, sit on the sidelines of our lives and the world is missing out. And so we help people through all of our work in body image resilience, identify every time you feel yourself slip away. Every time you try on an outfit in front of the mirror and all of a sudden that shame rises up, you slip outside of yourself to judge yourself like you are a nasty, critical, identical twin onlooker. We ask people to like, to, to denormalize that. Instead of living in this place where you're always just a little bit uncomfortable, you call it out the second it happens. And then you get back inside yourself. And we can talk about all the strategies for doing that. But I think for so many people, yeah. learning about self-objectification is an absolute game changer for identifying the state that we all live in. I mean, it's a good starting the point. way that you said how you're sitting there and watching yourself, you know what I mean? Like you're, you're sitting there, it's you, and then your other life Two. is split. And it's, yep. it's kind of crazy to think about because it's almost like we live in the state of like um, daydreaming or something like we're picturing ourselves doing the thing that we want to do, but Ugh. then we are like, nope, I don't like the way that that looks. So I actually, I'm not going to do it at all. I'm not going to show up for the workout class. Yes. I, um, I really, I, I was listening to a few podcasts that you guys did and I'd love you to talk about this. I have one thing to add you, to what you just said, just because it reminds me of, you know, have you seen the TikTok trends where people will record themselves no. in like a normal situation to see what they would look like at the party. And they're like, this is Ugh. my insecurity coming out. They'll literally put their phone down and they pretend they're talking to someone with a drink in their hand to oh, see I have seen what their these. body looks like and what they look uh -huh. like. And that is exactly what it reminded me of. Yep. Oh my gosh. Yep. That is, that's like envisioning self objectification. And it's really interesting because right like when we grew up, we didn't have a camera in our hands at all times where you could take a selfie or look at yourself in your reflection. Um, Lexi and I obviously looked at each other, but for most people, you weren't fully aware of how you looked from every angle. You you didn't constantly have videos shared publicly on the internet or within your family about what you look like. And cell phones have literally changed all of that. Reality TV in some ways changed all of that, where people were followed around by cameras and then were able to see exactly what they looked like. And that heightened this pressure for plastic yeah. surgery, for weight loss, all this kind of stuff. We're all kind of living in our own reality TV constantly, where we are monitoring yeah. ourselves and seeing ourselves being monitored through other people. Oh, that's really interesting. I studied digital media in college too, and I was a journalism major. So I, some of this, I'm like, holy crap, I remember learning about it, but I didn't know that you could take it further. So it's really interesting to me to listen to you guys talk about it. What I was going to ask about was you guys did a study for your PhDs and you took a poll of women. And I just want you to talk about the results of that because I thought it was just mind boggling. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the number one question, the I think Lexi has a little bit of a delay, but I'll jump in here. Um, or maybe I have the delay, who knows? <laughs> so the main question that we ask everybody at the beginning of our research, our PhD research, our online course, everything, is how do you feel about your body? 
And when you ask women that question, overwhelmingly, they will not only describe their bodies in very negative ways, but they will primarily describe their bodies based on terms of how they look. And again, very negative terms. So most people would look at that research and they would see, okay, girls and women feel badly about their bodies. They feel negatively, they're embarrassed and ashamed. We kind of already knew that before. But what a lot of people weren't talking about and still aren't talking about, unfortunately, is that in our research that replicates a lot of other research, about 80% of women were talking about how they looked, not really how they felt, not really what they could do or what they had experienced, just purely basically answering the question, what are your worst fears of what someone else sees when they look at you? That is not the same question as how do you feel about your body? Because we're people, we are dynamic human beings living inside these bodies our entire lives. And yet our experience and our feelings about them are fully defined by how we think other people might see us critically when they're looking at us. Like this is, this is such a huge um, drain on not only our self-esteem and our confidence, but also just our energy and our ability to really fully engage with other people and with our the rest of our lives. So um, our research showed that not only people felt very negatively, but that they were really consumed with how they looked. And that's where our research really starts from. Oh my God. Lexi, do you have anything to add? Just because I know you're delayed a little. Yeah, I have, I have a little something to add to that as well. When we're so immersed in this research that shows how defined and confined we all feel by our bodies and about our bodies, it would be easy to think like, oh my gosh, like the world is ending. There is no hope for us. There is no hope. Like, let's just sink into this place. Let's continue to chase these these unreal, unattainable ideals because what else is there to do? Like, we might as well just focus on our bodies as our projects, every inch of us from the roots of our hair to the bottoms of our feet. Like, because what else is there? There is no hope for us besides the pursuit of beauty. And it is so not true. In our research, we, we are so hopeful, like as hopeful as anybody, that people, there is a revolution happening of so many people who are recognizing that the way to happiness, the way to happy, healthy, like fulfilling relationships and success and joy and self-confidence, it doesn't come through these pursuits. Those don't actually get us there. And we all know that, you know that like personally, like the times that you from the outside got the most compliments, the times people thought you were the most hot, those were not necessarily the times where you felt the best or where you were treating yourself the best, you know? For so many of us, we look back at those yeah. times where we were the most ideally beautiful, the closest to the ideals, and that was when we were starving ourselves, where we hated ourselves, where people were giving us compliments and it just fueled, you know, our over-exercising, our, our obsession with the outsides of our bodies at the expense of the rest of our lives. And so in our research, we found a light at the end of that objectifying body shame tunnel, that tunnel that we all live in, that we don't even see a light outside of. And that is this idea of body image resilience. There's so many like really well-meaning people, content creators, activists who recognize that girls and women have a self-esteem problem, that like we have body image issues and they need to be solved. And yet we've been pretty vocal over the last several years that in many ways, some of these well-meaning people are not fixing the problem and are instead kind of exacerbating the problem because their answer, their intervention to these body image struggles is to go harder on looks, to say things like, every body is a bikini body. You are beautiful flaws and all. Every one of your flaws, they just make you more beautiful. If you could see yourself how other people see you, you would know how stunning you were. And like that, that definitely feels good for a second. Like, I think we all need to hear that, that we are the most critical judges of ourselves. And yet that is slapping a bandaid on a much deeper problem. Because if we are continuing to focus on the yeah. solution to objectification and self-objectification being more objectification, like you are beautiful, then we are forgetting to remind people you are so much more than beautiful, more than parts in need of fixing. When you can define yourself outside of those very narrow, unreal ideals, we can get somewhere, but it takes identifying the pain identifying the objectification, not just normalizing it as the wallpaper of our lives, but literally calling it out every time you hear somebody complimenting somebody else about how skinny they are right now, not knowing how they got there. 
Every time you hear somebody complimenting somebody else about, oh, you look so good, like your lips are just so full. Look at mine, I'm disgusting. I'm such a troll compared to you. These are not compliments. These are just causing us to like spiral into objectification. And so the way out is to call it. It, it is to name the problem and then get back inside our bodies, not use our bodies as this enemy, this thing we drag around that's so embarrassing and wrong, but to actually embrace like our bodies as instruments instead of ornaments that are here for our use, for our experience, mm -hmm. for our benefit first, before we prioritize anybody else's experience viewing us. Wow. It's, it's funny you're talking about this because right before you guys came on the podcast, we were recording our intro and we knew you guys were going to be guests. And I immediately started, I complimented you on, it was something it was, about her. It was something about her looks. Yeah. yeah. And I was like, oh my gosh, we're going to learn about this. And <laughs> I called it out during the intro because I was like, we need to learn other ways to compliment, you know, our bodies or our, because if Sid were to, I don't know, maybe she was dieting and then she yeah. gains weight and then she feels less worthy because I made this compliment as of today. So what do you recommend? Like, what are the damages in that, com those compliments? And then how else can you, you know, I, I feel like it's a form of bonding sometimes or an icebreaker. So what's a better way to connect with someone or a better way to compliment someone other than their, their looks, I guess. That sounds it, natural. Like, do you have any tips? <laughs> it's such a good question because that's so relatable. Like as women, when we haven't seen each other for a little while, or if we're just meeting someone for the first time, naturally we're gonna say something about their appearance. But I guess yeah. what we oh, want to yeah. point out is Every that, time. yeah, the, it's not actually that natural. This is learned behavior. So we learned that we were mm -hmm. socialized to perceive each other as bodies, as beauty being the most important thing about someone. It's what we value the most in ourselves. It's what we want the most. We've been taught our whole lives that being beautiful and looking better is the key to greater happiness and desirability. Like what are all the things we want in life? We want love, we want health, we want success, we want validation, happiness. And when every single message in our lives from families, from media, from the institutions we belong to tell us that the most beautiful women get all the good things in life, then of course, like no wonder that we are not only seeking those things for ourselves perpetually, but we're also trying to hype each other up into believing that they already mm -hmm. fit those ideals. So it's this really benevolent thing but that actually can have really negative effects. Like you mentioned, um, you may have complimented somebody who looks, maybe they look skinny that day. And for most people, yeah, they're gonna see that's a compliment because we live in a really fat phobic society that values thinness over anything. But when we're trying to break out of those molds and those norms that, that elevate some people and degrade almost everyone else, then we're gonna be really conscious about that. And one thing Lexi and I recommend, and we kind of caused a stir about several years ago when we first started talking about, especially on Instagram, we asked people to stop saying, you look so skinny or you've lost weight, tell me about it. Basically, we wanna ban that altogether out of pure benevolence and compassion for people who are struggling. Because people who, uh, people reached out to us like in droves who said, yes, this is so true. When I was in the height of my eating disorder, I received more compliments than I ever had in my life. It got more attention from people. Or I received so much praise from people for looking skinny when I was literally dying of cancer. Or when my mom died and I was in the throes of depression. We heard the saddest possible stories and not just a few of them, like it was the majority of people. So we recommend that people in general, don't talk about someone's body size or shape at all. You don't know exactly how they got there or why they got there or whether they never received any compliments before this moment and it's gonna, and you know, when they gain the weight back, which most people inevitably will, then that's gonna backfire. And so instead we recommend um, being kind of candid and vulnerable with people, candid, that makes sense for you guys. Um, that. <laughs> that's really the best way to do it is when someone is complimenting you on um, your body size or something else that might be kind of triggering or when you catch yourself doing it to somebody else, interrupt yourself, interrupt them and say, what I'm trying to do is compliment you and I know what you're trying to do is compliment me, but I'm trying so hard to stop valuing myself based on my weight or my body. I've just 
found so many ways that it actually makes me feel worse about myself. I'm preoccupied with that stuff. And so I'm making this really concerted effort to value myself for so much more. And I know you're trying to be nice and I thank you and appreciate that, but will you help me? Because I might not be complimenting you so much on your body, even though of course I want to and I think all the good things about you. But um, if we could join together to try to just chill on that for a little while and value other things, it would mean a lot. I think that can be a good way to like break mm. that ice and make sure people's defenses don't go up by you saying, um, excuse me, I don't want to be told yeah. that I look skinny. That's rude. You know, no one wants that. <laughs> no, I love the way you put that too. It's, it's a good, it, it's a way to actually get us to move in the right direction by being real and being like, I'm trying. I just, yeah. this is making me feel uncomfortable basically yeah. is what you're saying. Yeah. Um, I have to ask because we've talked about this before too. Do men face the same objectifications as women in like your research. I know it's woman based, but are they facing those same things and are they experiencing the things that women are right now? At this point, I mean, our research shows and much research shows that women are still bearing the brunt of objectification and sexual objectification in this culture. It is just seeped so deep into the bones of our society that um, it, it shows up in ways that you don't realize. It shows up in that one dimensional idea of what a woman or a girl can be, like through children's media all the way up. So you still see objectification so incredibly prevalent because you see very few body types represented positively for women. So you're only seeing women and girls, even like girl animal characters in kids media that are all shaped very thin, very tall, curves in all the right places, big eyes, tiny nose, big lips, tiny chin, you know, like the long flowing hair. But male characters and men in general, they get to show up. They get to show up and be sexy and be loved and be old <laughs> and be black and be white mm -hmm. and be redheaded. You know, like, oh my gosh, in every single way. And so in that way, that is just one clear example of the way objectification is not hitting men as hard as it is women. That is not to say that men are not objectified and that are, they are not facing like tremendous body image burdens. They are. We're seeing, you know, that media makers and advertising execs and, you know, industry leaders are conceiving of more flaws every day for everyone. Um, but we'll know if men are being hit as hard with objectifying ideals when men start thinking about their eyelashes every day. When men start thinking about like the length, the darkness of their eyelashes, the size of their pores, when they are being sold anti-aging products from the time they're 19, then we will see that men are being hit with these objectifying ideals at the same level as women. But until then, I would argue, I think Lindsay would agree, that women are still bearing the brunt of that objectification. Yeah, where we see um, men really affected is in terms of fitness media. Um, obviously, there's a ton of research to show that girls feel the pressure to be smaller, to take up less space, and boys and men feel the pressure to be bigger and take up more space, specifically zero body fat, but all the muscle you can get. So that shows up in rates of steroid usage and you know abuse of all kinds of um, muscle enhancement products and whatever that really hurt their health. Um, and that has huge effects as far as um, males entering eating disorder treatment and suffering with disordered eating and disrupted eating and uh, struggling with body image issues at greater rates than they ever have been before. And that really is yeah. a direct tie in to um, muscular bodies being elevated above all else. Um, at the same time, girls and women are primarily valued for how they look. That doesn't mean that girls and women aren't also valued for other things. We definitely are. But those women aren't seen as successful. They don't get the airtime. They don't get the attention, the validation. They don't reach to as high of levels unless they also fit the beauty ideals, the white ideals, the thin ideals that women are held to. And men, not so much. Men reach the highest levels of um, every industry, regardless of how they look. So men are, are valued, of course, for their looks and for their, their fitness level in their bodies, but they are also equally valued for their intelligence, their wealth, their humor, their athletic skills, and all other markers of success. That's really tough because I, the reason I ask that in just if men are involved in this too is because men are the ones making the decisions in high up media. They have been for yeah. so many years, which is what we we all yeah. we learned in school, in, like in digital media. Um, they're making the decisions on who is seen in front of the camera. So my reason I kind of set up that question is because 
how do you explain to somebody who doesn't believe that this is going on, that believes that society has chosen that this look is going to be the look and everybody agrees upon that just because that's humanity. Like, how do you explain to somebody who doesn't understand the situation, what's actually going on and that it's a real thing that's harming us as women? With social media, maybe, or with media in general? Yeah, great question. Well, one way that you can see it is how those trends have evolved over time. This isn't something that has been natural from the time people, um, you know, evolved. The evolution of beauty ideals has been really dramatic, especially since the beginning of the 20th century. Um, bigger bodies, larger, more voluptuous bodies were very much valued at the turn of the century, the turn of the 20th century. And um, over time, as advertising rose to prominence and became one of the biggest industries, then women were targeted and thin ideals became what was most in vogue. Every single ideal that you see, um, any physical ideal that's been directed toward women has been fully profit driven. What will make the most money? What is the hardest to achieve? What's the hardest to achieve is thinness, especially over time as um, our po populations of all people have gotten larger, but especially in the West. And uh, so it is the most unattainable. It is the most profitable. The diet and weight loss industry makes, uh, I think two years ago, it was $68 billion. It rises every single year, even during um, uh, basically a depression, an economic depression. And it doesn't work for anyone. There's like between two and four or 5% of people are able to lose weight and keep it off for any meaningful amount of time. And the other 95, 96, up to 98%, maybe loses a little bit of weight and it comes right back within one year to five years. So it doesn't work. It's highly profitable. We are driven by these ideals that we will be able to be healthier and happier and more lovable once we reach it. But um, you can see how those ideals have changed so dramatically over time from the thin ideals that really were very rampant up until um, the 90s when cosmetic surgery became a little bit more popular and more profitable. And then breast augmentation came on the scene. So you got to be really, really skinny, but you also need the big boobs. Um, oh, yeah. Then in more recent years, obviously, we know the thick ideal or the curvy ideal has really taken over. Um, and once again, that's not just like a natural uh, ideal or shape. That's something that is basically only reachable through cosmetic surgery for 99% of the population. And so it's those you can be thick, but you can have no signifiers of thickness. There's no cellulite. There's no stretch marks. Um, there's, you know, no, nothing that would show that you are curvy anywhere out, outside of the ideal places. Like, you know, it's basically just butt and boobs. Everywhere else has got to be as thin as it ever was, you know? So it, I think that evolution proves just how unnatural it is. I, I think just in addition to that, we're seeing now that people like the Kardashians and others are taking out their implants. So for a while there, people were saying, you guys, like this body image movement is working because now a thicker ideal is in. And we would always push back and say, that's not progress. That's another thing to add to the to-do list that people have to take on. You're thin, cool. Now you have to get the boobs and the butt and the lips, you know, mm -hmm. like there's always another thing. And the ideals are shifting so rapidly, so quickly that now we're seeing a more thin, gaunt ideal back in. And that is all expensive. All of the people who had that work done now have to get rid of it. And now we have completely excluded a huge number of people who cannot get to those ideals any other way. So we would say, I mean, if you do your research, it's really easy to see that sexism is at the heart of every single thing that we've been taught is the most beautiful. It is just, you know, thin eyebrows are back, you know, like every single thing, it's just a constant shift. And so much of it is targeted at women. Men's ideals don't go in and out of fashion like women's do. And that's how you know that sexism and a huge amount of profit is to blame. I'm just wondering, how do you think Instagram plays a part in this? Because I mean, a lot of our audience is Instagram, TikTok, is there anything, I, I heard you talk about an algorithm type of design with Instagram, and I'm curious about that. Yeah. Yeah, so, we always talk about social media. 
Sorry, we're talking over each other again. I'll jump in and then you do. Um, so we always talk about social media can basically be your best friend or your worst enemy. It is truly self-help or self-harm because it can provide the way out. You can see more people, um, not only a bigger, wider variety of ideals about just what normal, regular people look like. You can see yourself reflected. Um, you could also just wind up down the rabbit hole of all of the fixation on beauty and thinness and everything else that values women still as bodies first and foremost, um, secondary to just being humans or doing literally anything else. So we like to talk about how um, you can basically train your algorithm and really kind of train your brain by doing a media cleanse. Um, we do, we recommend intermittent media fasting where you just take a break, you take a regularly scheduled break from media, especially from social media, literally delete the apps off your phone because if you're like us, you will impulsively go back to them. And oh, when yeah. you do that, you give yourself a chance to reset. You reset your own mind and your perception of media, not only your body, but other people's bodies and also what you're using it for. Like for a lot of us who have body shame or anxiety in other ways, we will impulsively turn to those apps as a distraction and it actually maximizes the shame that we feel and keeps us sucked into those rabbit holes of thinking, well, once I buy this, once I do this, once I get the right angles, the right lighting, the right bikini pick that will get me the attention, the validation that I want, then we'll really be able to feel more confident and feel happier. And it just doesn't work that way. So when you come back from your intermittent media fast, then we recommend unfollowing, unsubscribing, anyone that is triggering your body anxiety. They might be the greatest people in the world who don't mean harm on anyone, but if you're following them and they make you have to go shopping or want to like cut out food groups from your diet or in any other way feel bad about yourself and do the doom scroll to the bottom of their feed, then you know you should probably like mute them, unfollow for a little while. They don't have to know about it, but just like do yourself a favor and take a break and then replace that not only with time off of social media where you're actually interacting with people face to face and using your body as an instrument instead of looking at it as an ornament, but also um, replace it with people who are doing other things than just looking hot and, you know, being valued for more than just looking hot. I love the way you put that too. Wow. And it, it's so eye-opening too to think about your followers and and the people that are on your feed right now like at this moment and even if you're listening right now and your listeners like you're like oh god i know exactly who's bothering me right now yeah it's hard not to get mad at them though for for being hot and i'm, I'm just i'm putting it out there as a comment because they've got the money to do it and they're doing it especially the big time people right the reality tv you talked about kardashians yeah how do we like not get mad. I mean, I'm going to actively like unfollow these people, but it's still out there. And it, honestly, it still bothers me that maybe the men in my life or man yeah. in my life are looking at those things and yeah. taking it in as beauty still. Like, how do you not get mad at that ideal? And thinking that's the standard. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I uh, here, here's what has worked for me and what we've written a bit about in our book and elsewhere. I found that when you are feeling the most triggered and the most body shame, it's when you feel the most divided with women in general. Women become our competition. They become, instead of being allies, sisters, we are in this together. We're all navigating this super shitty objectifying world. Instead, we're all competitors and we are playing a game where there are limited resources, limited love, limited popularity, limited beauty, sex appeal, all the things. It's a lie. It's a lie we've been taught from the time we're young that we're supposed to be playing and it's how we win. It's how we thrive. It's not true. And so it is so easy to look at other women, especially when you're feeling, when you're self-objectifying, when you're objectifying yourself, you turn that lens on other people and they become just super hot, too sexy. Ugh. Look at her boob job. Look at her face. Can you believe what she's wearing? Can you believe she poses like that? It's so easy to just, that's the objectifying world. Yeah. Oh my gosh. It's what we do. Sid and I's favorite pastime. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. I'm just thinking of Sid and I's favorite pastime is seeing if someone got a boob job. We're like, oh, wait, but did she get a boob job? And we'll zoom in We're and we'll like, figure did it she? out. Did she? Did she? Did she? Did she? She looks so good. <laughs> Sorry. Totally continue. I had to say that. No, we've all been there. We have all done the deep dive to figure out, like, did she lose weight? Or is she just, like, posing in different lighting now? Let's scroll five years back and do a before and after. Yeah. Oh, my, God, yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. All of it. The nose, the everything. Yeah. yeah. We've all been there. We've been taught to do that. And it doesn't help us at all. 
It causes us to feel more and more divided instead of united when we do that. And yet we've found that when you can heal your own body image and extend more self-compassion to yourself, when you begin to see yourself as more than a body, you start to see everybody else as more than a body too. And they become less threatening to your relationships, your own sense of self-worth. All of a sudden, they are people too. They are navigating this world that is so painful and so hard. And you start to see, especially the people that are working so hard toward those beauty ideals that are you know, succumbing to so much pain and money and energy and effort. Those ones, they're hurting, you know? And where they find oh. their, they find their value in, in beauty. And they're, and that's probably where they're going to find their value in beauty until they rethink the direction of their mindset and what they idealize. Yes. So it is kind of actually sad. And as they age, it's, you know, you become less and less of that ideal. And then what else do you have, you know? Right. So if yes. you're, if you're focused on that. Oh. Yeah. Wow. That was, that hit deep. Oh, good. When we're doing like, especially our speaking events, we do these big events uh, across the country. And a lot of times I catch myself looking down at like the most beautiful women that I can tell are just like, they're a 10. They might not know it, but they are. And I always catch myself thinking they're rolling their eyes at this. Like they don't need this. And those are the women that come up to us afterward that line up and say, I needed this so bad. I, from the time I was little, have been valued for my body, for my beauty. It's what everybody complimented me on. And I have worked so hard to stay there, to keep the compliments, to keep the love. And now I'm worried my husband's going to leave me because I'm getting older. I'm invisible now because I've gained weight, whatever the thing is. They fall the hardest. And so that has given us a lot of compassion for realizing that a lot of times the most beautiful women in the room are the ones that are hurting the most by the subjectifying culture. Oh, wow. Wow. When you, you even talked about aging right there and like we're getting towards the end and we'll, we'll wrap up pretty soon, but I, I just want to talk about aging because you, you said it, aging and gaining weight and getting older and like moving out of the like ideal, so, you know, social age to be where you're young and your skin is, has less yeah. elasticity or whatever. How do we, as women age and really like love ourselves for who we are and love the process? Because I think that's the hardest of it all is because it's inevitable, but it's not welcomed by society in a true way that mm. makes us feel loved. Yep. We have to build our self-worth outside of just how we look because it's always been a losing game. Honestly, like Lexi just said, the women who are the most beautiful, the most close to the ideals, often suffer the most in this environment when they're being held to those same standards in order to maintain their yeah. self-worth and confidence and value to other people. And so there's no way to win if we're continuing to play this game where we're being rewarded for being the most easily objectified. And so, regardless of whether we're aging or not, we've got to find a new way to value ourselves. And that's kind of the whole premise of our book, More Than a Body. We yeah. equip people with strategies to be able to build their body image resilience. So the, the nature of the whole model of our body image resilience idea is that we live in this environment that will continue to trigger us, to push us down, to make us feel bad, especially as we're aging, as we're growing, as we're shrinking, we're having babies, we're um, getting broken up with, getting divorced, all of getting injured, all of these things will change our bodies significantly for the rest of our lives. And we have got to find a way to navigate it. So in order to survive and thrive in this environment where we will continuously be reminded that beauty is the most important thing about us, we need to feel every one of those moments. We call them waves of disruption in a, the sea of objectification. They will come up and they'll knock you out of your comfort zone and remind you of all these negative things about our environment and how we're valued. And in order to be able to survive, we have to respond to those reactions in a new way, in a better way than what we have been doing. If you think about the way you've reacted to times when you felt embarrassed or ashamed of your body or extra triggered and um, self-objectifying, then maybe it was through trying to hide your body or fix your body. It's kind of the fight or flight of the body image world where we opt out of events and activities and situations. We hide from the camera because we don't want to be seen. And in the meantime, we try to fix ourselves through dieting, through um, cosmetic surgery, buying new clothes, makeup, whatever it might be. 
none of that works. It doesn't improve our self-esteem or our confidence in any way. It just gives us this temporary feeling of control. And that keeps us in this uncomfortable comfort zone where we are self-objectifying and feeling negatively toward our bodies. When we go through those moments of being triggered, we have to respond in a new way. So recognize how you have been responding, and maybe it is with the dieting, with disordered eating, with self-harm for some people, abusing drugs or alcohol. What's that thing? And instead of just impulsively, innately turning to that as your vice to cope with harmful negative feelings, instead, you can choose to stop, take a deep breath, literally just take three deep breaths, relax your stomach muscles, We've all been sucking in our stomachs for so long, we don't even recognize it. Let your stomach go. Take three deep breaths and repeat some mantra that can snap you back into this reality of who you really are, not who you are been tricked into thinking you are, which is just a body. Maybe it's, I'm more than a body. My body is an instrument, not an ornament. Find something in our book, anywhere. It could be a totally external thing that helps you get back inside your own body. Because self-objectification is a cloud of anxiety. It is external, it is abstract, you're watching yourself from the outside. In order to reconnect with our bodies, we have to physically be inside them, consciously be thinking about how we're feeling, feeling all of our senses, and be able to tap back into what we really know about ourselves. One way I do that that works really fast is actually finding a photo or a video of yourself from when you were a little kid before you started self-objectifying and being embarrassed of your body. I have a picture of myself from when I was four or five years old, and I just think I look so cute, so innocent, and I see so many of my same facial features in her, and that's my little Lindsay. So when I am feeling self-conscious and negative, I look at her, I see the same body I was born into, that I've lived every second of my life in, all the bad and all the good, and I think, how would I talk to her? What would I want her to know about her body, her value, and her worth in an environment that makes it really difficult? And that's where you start to make better decisions and exercise this muscle for body image resilience that gets easier and easier every single day. Wow. wow. I honestly feel like kind of emotional. If I could add something to. Yeah, yes, of course. Please. When we're talking about like the fact that every single one of us are getting older every day, we are getting older. Our bodies are inevitably changing. It is so easy to think about that with dread, which men don't do. That is that is a burden that women bear, that we have been told in our objectifying state that we are objects that are not meant to change, that we are bad and wrong and unlovable if we do. That is the most demeaning thing in the whole world, and yet we've all taken that on. We believe that about ourselves, our dynamic bodies, we believe are wrong for showing lines of smiling and being in the sun and all of the, the signs of having lived. And it's so easy to remember that right now and to think how crazy, but then we go and everybody we interact with, so many of the people we interact with are behind a screen and you cannot see the dynamics of their actual face. You do not see their pores. You can't see their lines. When you're scrolling, it's not there. People are filtered. Even Zoom, even just our own cameras, they make us one dimensional. And so we forget that we are comparing our real natural faces to people behind screens and people who are getting injections consistently and are doing that every three months for the rest of their lives. And there's nothing wrong with that. We're never going to villainize anybody for what they do in the name of just trying to feel okay. But we do ask, and we do write about this a lot, that we all take the opportunity to think about our own privilege in this world. I think about my own privilege. I, I've got everything I need in this life, you know, despite being fatter than I ever wanted to be, despite like aging and getting wrinkles on my forehead, my life is incredible. I have all the privilege in the world. And so when one of my friends came to me last week and said, now, I don't want you to judge me, but I've been thinking about getting Botox. I said, I would never judge you. You can do whatever you want. I love you so much, but I want you to know that I will be your friend that I'm not getting injections. Like I've already decided I, I, I'm not like just based on our platform, what we do, like we have drawn the line at things that are painful and <laughs> that is a painful intervention I don't want. <laughs> and so I told her I would be there for her, but that I wanted her to know that 
what, whatever she chooses to do with her body, like she is so, she's good and she's more. And I love her regardless. And I think if each one of us think about our privilege and we think about the ways that we might be able to push back or opt out of just even one of these ideals that you think you need to do just to be you, that you can prove to yourself if you push off the Botox for three months, that even if those lines do appear, you are an effing human. It's okay to have those lines. You give other people the power to have those lines too. You know, I think that as we exert our privilege yeah. to stand up for other people that maybe don't have the privilege to stand up, that feel like they'd lose their job, that they'd lose their boyfriend, that they wouldn't have the opportunities, that if we can show them a little bit more reality, we give other people the courage to push back too. Oh Ooh. my gosh. I I drop. I have had goosebumps for 80% of this conversation and I look at, I'm getting I had little tears in my I'm eyes getting, for one moment. I'm getting tears in my eyes just because this is, you do have goosebumps. I do. I just can't, I just feel like oh. it is, it's so, this is like life changing. I think, Thank I you. hope our listeners feel the same way and I hope they took out their notebooks. Hope mm -hmm. they're ordering your book because yeah, like I felt heard a lot in that conversation. So. The impact that you guys have had on us just within an hour let yeah. alone the Holy people shit. that you've impacted at your like, like, you know, um, what are they not a convention? What are they called? Events, just Speaking anything events, like perhaps yeah. you guys for leaning into something. That's yeah. A huge, huge hole in society. Seriously. Like, well, Thank you gave you me so goosebumps. Much. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> I wish this was a conversation in every single school. Yeah. Yeah. Us too. Growing up. Yeah. It should I be. do. Last week we spoke Maybe at one day. We spoke at a boarding school for boys and girls of like uh, 1,100 oh, wow. students or something. And it's hard for teenagers to hear this stuff because, you know, it affects some of them and it really doesn't affect others. Mm -hmm. And so when there's boys in the room, it's difficult, but it's essential to start these conversations as early as possible. So like start it with your little siblings, nieces and nephews, other kids that, you know, you live yeah. nearby or whatever. Yeah. It's it's so important just to plant these seeds. Yes. Have this conversation. Listen to this episode with your boyfriend, your husband, your yeah. friends. Send it. Um, if you do listen, please, you know, tag the episode. Tag Lindsay and Lexi. And where can our listeners find you? You can find us on Instagram at beauty underscore redefined. We aren't posting very much there recently. We've taken a little um, media fast, which has been the greatest thing in the whole world. But we have a yeah. ton of content there. Um, our website is um, morethanabody.org. And most importantly, um, our book. Our book, More yes, Than a Body, uh, Your Body I'm is an Instrument, now. Not an Ornament. This is the best thing we've ever done. And it is honestly like the distillation of uh, how many? Like 15 years, basically, of research and work that we've done. And we're really proud of it. So we're grateful for all the people who have uh, already found it and shared it with people or rented it from their yeah. library or whatever. I cannot wait to read it. I'm serious. Like I'm, oh, I, and I'm not, a, I'm not a full reader yet. I'm changing yeah. my definition of <laughs> yes. me, but I'm getting into reading. So I'm very Sweet. excited. Thank you for being they here. They did their own, oh. you guys did your own audio book too, didn't oh, yeah. you? Yeah. Yep. We had to audition. <laughs> they chose us though. <laughs> so we were really excited. <laughs> wait, cool. You guys are great speakers, so oh, thank yeah, you. I'm not thank surprised you. whatsoever. Thank you for being here. You guys share your impact um, if you can to like listeners. Like I, I would love to hear like how you feel after this. Like that's yeah. really yeah. what I care about is how are you feeling inside? Cause that's all what it's all about. Lexi, Lindsay, thank you for being here. It really means the world to us, seriously. Thank you. Oh, of course, thank you so much for having us. This has been an awesome conversation. Straight Candid Listener Advice this week, um, we have a write in from somebody and I'm just gonna go right into it. I'm pumped. Sorry in advance, I know this is super, isn't super concise she says, but I wanted to first say I love your podcast and both of you girls. You guys are absolutely hilarious. Okay, she's being so nice and have the best insights oh, and perspective stop. on every situation. Sid, oh, she's being so Okay, nice. I recently got out of very acts toxic. Like, sorry, <laughs> acts like she hasn't read it before. Oh, stop. I know, well actually I, I do skip around when I read yeah. in things cause I'm like, I need to get this. Okay, Quick. I'll shut up now. All right, here we go. I re recently got out of a t very toxic relationship. We were only together for about six months, but he somehow caused more damage than my 3.5 year toxic relationship ever did. He seemed perfect at the beginning. 10 years older, I'm 26, he's 36, has a good job, drives a Ferrari, wowza, and made me feel so adored. We were always laughing, had great sexual chemistry, and everything seemed amazing. All of that said, he did a complete 180 a couple months ago. He controlled everything from my food to my friends, my haircuts, how I look, my body, oh. and everything in between. 
He picked fights, gaslit me, constantly belittled me, shamed me for not working out as much as I'd used to or looking how I used to, oh. and generally had zero respect for me as a person all of a sudden. Once I finally realized how toxic it was, it took me um, of his many dramatic breakups at face value to realize it's been two weeks of short texts here and there from him dragging out any kind of conversation, just dragging me along. I know he is horrible for me, but for some reason I cannot let him go. I'm so upset and don't know um, what small insane part of me is hanging on to at least the tiny bit of hope he'll be begging for me back. I'm crazy, but I know I, I need to leave. Any advice you can give me to help me completely cut him off and out of my life so I can heal and move on. Oh my gosh. Oh my I, Lord. Okay, a few things to say right away is the 180 is confusing me. Like, I don't think you woke up one day and he was just like all of a sudden a whole different person unless he is, we've talked about this before, picking a reason or trying to find a reason to break up with you. So like he is just being as big of an asshole as he can because he's like, all right, like this is over. But also like trying to leave this relationship, you need to remember like we just talked about, like where is your worth? Are you finding you're afraid that no one else will love you and that is why you're stuck in the relationship. But like knowing that you're worth it, no matter your body, your looks, knowing you're worthy, finding worth in whoever else you are, your passions, I think being more secure with that, it'll be easier to let go of someone who's not treating you right. Oh, I like that. You worded that really well. Thanks. I think what's confusing to me in the 182 is it almost sounds like he's using the excuse because he found somebody else. Like if your attention, your 100% attention yeah, is thought, on somebody and then all of a sudden maybe he you know, was interested in somebody like, else. That's, yeah, I know. It makes me, it gives me like cheater, cheater vibes and I only say that because I felt it before. My only other thing is, like Self said, literally retweet on that one. Um, but you've got to think and put yourself first in the situation and start to process, like, do I even want somebody that could flip like that? Like, do I want somebody that can make a 180 and treat me like that? The answer is no. The second part is, is um, oh my God, I keep losing my train of thought and I have something really good to oh. say. Let me wait, wait until it comes I, back. You're fine. I literally thought you were just itching your vagina for a no, second. No, it was my leg. It was my leg. Yeah, this girl, I really do think um, you need to evaluate, you know, who you are. And oh. I'm, just, I'm just chatting for Sid. I know, I'm like, wait a minute. I'm like, um, I'm, I'm like evaluate you, who you are. <laughs> I don't I'm know like, why I did I lose? I had a brain <laughs> fart all of a sudden. You don't want somebody like this. Like, so here's my thing is you don't want to let go because it's a control. It's like, what's norm. It's what you had. It's like yep. what you thought you wanted. It's never as good as it looks from the outside. Okay. But you have to start to realize That's that there point. were signs that you weren't seeing because you saw some other, maybe some sort of shiny things mm -hmm. that would have probably, you had probably would have not seen if there had mm -hmm. been like, you know, a good age gap, maybe yep. a little bit of money, maybe a little bit of like, you know, just like, Ease, ease of relationship and sexuality becoming like first and foremost, look for those signs next time because yep. you're probably in your head thinking there's no way I'm going to find somebody that treated me like he used to. It's like, well, he used to treat you like that. You were just infatuated. You were infatuated. You know, that time. the honeymoon vibe right away. You're yeah. just like, every, and sometimes you think about your exes and the same thing. Like mm -hmm. you forget about all that shit they did because you're like, oh, it's just, I was just infatuated by them. And now you look back, you're like, I let him do what? Yeah, like really? Uh, Did I really let him do yeah, that to me? Right? Excuse me? No way. So just use this as an opportunity to heal yourself first. Really think about what your important things are in your relationship, what you're looking for, and then try to not miss the signs this love, time. Love, love, love. You know what I mean? Y'all, remember, if you have an advice question for us, you want us to answer, you can submit it on our link in bio in our podcast. But do we have a listener straight in a moment? Oh, do we? Do we? Do we? Do we? Do we? Oh my God. Do we? I'm choking. Oh no. Oh no. Oh no. Oh, oh no, oh, she's shoot. scrolling. Wait. Oops. Uh oh, wait, is it this it's one? Okay, I'm going to sing for you. Oh winner. no, I read both of them on the last episode. Oh, I guess I'm we just embarrassed. Have, I guess we just have advice this week, you guys. That's so embarrassing. That's okay. I, th I, I thought I only I read one of had them. A, I almost had a backup because I thought maybe we forgot. I totally did because <laughs> okay. I literally, I totally Come thought I read week one of for them. Straight in a moment. That's embarrassing. Oh my god! E either way, too, you guys keep writing in those um, yeah. straight in moments on easy, our easy. link in bio. It's super easy. You just click the bio, you'll see it right away, you'll and see. try to keep it concise, but also like tell your story, honey. Yeah. Um, we hope you loved today's episode because it was so impactful, and I hope that you bring this conversation to the men in your life who need to hear yes. it, and the women in your life that need exactly. to hear it. Exactly. Mostly women, but we would love if men understood this as well. Yeah, please. <laughs> All right, you guys. Um, you can follow us at Straight Candid Podcast on Instagram. I'm at Candid Soph. I'm at Candid Sid. 
subscribe on YouTube, subscribe, follow on Spotify. Please rate and review on Apple Podcasts. But other than that, we'll see you next week, y'all. We love you. Love you. Bye. Bye.